Let's get started. Hello, friends. If you will remember, in episode two, we talked about the psychopaths who rule the world. Uh, some people call this the Illuminati, the New World Order, things of this nature. Well, I read a book. I spent the last two days reading a really incredible book that I want to go ahead and suggest all of the listeners of the show purchase and read. The book is called Shadow Men, an Encyclopedia of Mind Control by Anthony Napoleon. And this book really, really explains in, in very interesting but precise detail where the so-called Illuminati or shadow men come from and how they are a natural part of the human evolution. They're not uh, some alien hybrid. They're not reptile people. This book is, is no conspiracy theory paranoia and simply a factual education about the so-called Illuminati. And I'll go ahead and read you just a, a synopsis of the book. Psychological operations, or PSYOPs, are the preferred method by which shadow men socially engineer the masses' consent on a myriad of important issues. The author provides numerous examples of how social engineers have modified the public's perceptions and attitudes about America's founders, slavery, financial markets, dating and mating customs, self-perception, and a laundry list of other matters people have no idea were socially engineered. The leader will become expert on the character of the men who work in the shadows, the, whose sole reason for living is to control others in service to accumulating wealth and power, of which they never, ever have enough. The reader is provided a step-by-step -step program that promises to strip away shadow men's brainwashing of them and return the reader to his natural state of freedom and happiness. And friends, I can attest to that synopsis because I did spend the last two days reading this book. It is incredible. One of the most eye-opening books I've read. It was able to put in words all the thoughts that I had in my head but was not able to uh, to say. So I recommend you go ahead and pick yourself up a copy of Shadow Men, an encyclopedia of mind control. Lock the door, get you a cup of coffee, get you a notepad, and read that book because it is very, very important and interesting. And friends, what do you say we go ahead and start the show? Last week, we had an uh, opening question about karma. I get a lot of questions about karma and good versus bad. Questions like this. Is karma true? The great ones all seem to realize karma exists, and most people have a stupid understanding of it. Eating an animal is not bad karma, but torturing that animal or eating excessively with greed beyond your needs would get you another birth as an animal. End quotes. I'm going to explain karma to you in a way that you have never heard it explained before. Karma is real, but not in the way you think. You will not get good karma or bad karma for any actions that you take because there is no such thing as good karma or bad karma. Why? Because nature does not understand good or bad. Something is or it isn't. An animal eats another animal. It isn't good or bad. It just is. Good or bad is a man-made concept, much like sin, and we need these concepts to live peacefully together. In fact, karma and sin are exactly the same things. In the West, we have sin, and in the East, they have karma. In the West, we tell children that if they are bad, they will burn in hell for their sin. In the East, they say they will be reborn as an animal for their bad karma. Karma and sin are exactly the same concepts. There are ways to get children to behave in the way we want them to behave. Children cannot process the reality of karma and sin because the laws of karma and sin are actually very practical. Because children do not understand the practical, we make up grand lies to teach children what we believe is right and wrong, good and bad. The more we teach children about karma and sin, the more we believe it is true. So we grow up ourselves without an understanding of what karma and sin actually are. Because we've been teaching and believing in karma and sin for so long, we have totally forgotten the underlying reality. Now I'm going to teach you exactly what karma and sin actually are. I'm going to show you exactly why and how you receive good karma or bad karma, and exactly why and how you are punished for your sins. So what exactly is karma? 
Karma is the law of cause and effect. That's it. That is all karma is. If you do this, you can expect that to happen. If you touch a hot stove, then you will receive a burn on your hand. If you drink too much alcohol, you will be looked upon with scorn and disgust by your neighbors. If you eat too much unhealthy food, you become unhealthy later in life. If you do harm to someone, they will want to do harm to you. Karma has nothing to do with good or bad. Karma has everything to do with cause and effect. Over the years we have all forgotten the simple fact of life. And what was once simple, do this and that will happen, has become magical. According to the myth of karma, rather than doing this to get that, you do this and then you are reborn as a goat in the next life. The misunderstanding of karma has caused people great grief because they no longer understand the practical. People no longer understand that if they eat too much carbohydrates, their blood sugar increases and they get diabetes. Instead, they think it is their bad luck to get diabetes and that they need medicine to cure it. Rather than taking responsibility for themselves, they wonder, why me? Rather than quitting the food that gives them illness, they continue the bad habits to give them the bad results. This is the myth of karma versus the law of cause and effect. The myth of karma is exactly this. If you are bad in this life, you will pay for it in another life. The reality of karma is this. If you are bad in this life, you will pay for it in this life. The myth of karma that we teach to children has good intentions to get children to behave properly, but it has horrible consequences. Teaching the myth of karma rather than the law of cause and effect causes people to become enfeebled and helpless. Rather than help themselves and quit their bad habits, they resign to the fact that it is their bad karma to be sick, stupid, and poor for their entire lives. Because they believe they did something in a past life to receive bad karma, they do nothing in this life to change it. If they knew the simple secret of karma, that it is nothing but the law of cause and effect, then they would know that they have the power within themselves to change their circumstance. It is not your bad karma to be poor. It is your bad habits that cause you to be poor. It is not your bad luck to be sick and unhealthy. You caused the sickness by your own bad habits. Do this, and that will happen. Your actions have direct reactions, and all circumstances in your life are reactions to actions you have taken. That's how you become sick, stupid, poor, and worthless. You are not unlucky. You are ignorant to the law of cause and effect. When you understand that all sickness you have is created by you, you can understand the opposite of this. Because all sickness is created by you, all health, wellness, and success are also created by you. It is the actions that you take today that give you your karma tomorrow. Whether they be good or bad, sin or virtue, is entirely up to you today, right now. However, many people are happy to sin today because they think they will not be held accountable until much later. The myth of sin is that you will pay for your sins in another life, or after death. The reality is much different. Our friend at the beginning said overeating food will cause you to be reborn as an animal in the next life. In the West, we call overeating by the name of gluttony, and it is one of our seven deadly sins. We're taught that if you sin, you pay for it when you die and go to hell. This teaching enfeebles people and makes them unbearably ignorant to the reality of sin. Here is the reality of sin. You will not be punished for your sins, you will be punished by your sins. You will not pay for sins after you die. You will pay for today's sins tomorrow. If you overeat, you are not going to burn in hell. Instead, you are going to get fat, sick, and unhealthy. If you do not understand the law of cause and effect, you will just think it is your bad luck, your genetics, or something else outside of your control that makes you fat and sick. Nothing outside of your control makes you fat, sick, or stupid. All is in your control, but you have to know what sin really is. Sin is the law of cause and effect explained by the Western mind. The seven deadly sins will give you negative consequences in your life today 
they will not place you in a sea of fire when you die. It will seem like you just have bad luck until you open your eyes and understand that everything happens for a reason. Everything that happens to you happens because of something you did in the past. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Eating too many carbohydrates feels good today. Tomorrow it will feel like diabetes. Drinking alcohol feels good today. Tomorrow it will feel like liver cirrhosis. Drinking too much coffee this morning will feel great. And tonight it will feel like insomnia. Lack of exercise today will give you thyroid problems tomorrow. All of these health problems you receive seem so mysterious only because you do not see the connection between cause and effect. Sin and karma are exactly the same thing. They are Eastern and Western concepts we use to teach children the law of cause and effect. Now that you know the reality that everything that happens to you is a direct result of some action you took, you can stop fearing bad karma and you can stop fearing burning in hell for your sins. Instead, you can start to take daily positive actions that get you daily positive results. You can quit the bad habits, otherwise known as sins, that bring you disastrous results. All power in the world exists within you. You are the creator of your reality, and you create your reality by the actions that you take. Make your life great by understanding that if I do this, then that will happen. With this understanding of karma and sin, you are armed with the knowledge of the ancients. You have all of the knowledge of the religions of the East and the West in one tiny little phrase. If I do this, then that will happen. In other words, you reap what you sow. So friend, make sure that you sow the seeds of good karma. I would hate to see you suffer from bad karma after you have been taught the law of cause and effect. Because now you have no excuse. Nothing is outside of your control, and there is no bad karma in your life that comes from outside sources. Whether for good or bad, you are the source of your karma. You are the creator of your fortune or misfortune. You are the one who is responsible. So take control. Stop whining about bad luck or bad karma. And create your destiny the way you want it to be. All power exists within you and nowhere else. That's it, friend. The law of cause and effect fully explained. Karma is under your direct control. Will you control it? Or will you let it control you? Graham asks, Have there been any updates to John Doe Bodybuilding and his books Becoming the Bull and the John Doe Bodybuilding Bible? I noticed they were taken down from the website. Just curious if anything was new. I've got great news, friend. John Doe Bodybuilding is back, and so are his books. John Doe Bodybuilding took a little break to be with family and to not write for a little while. He is back in full force, and he is writing uh, two or three articles every week, and they are killer. So I recommend you check out johndobodybuilding.com. He is back, and he is the utmost authority on bodybuilding. Hercules asks, Victor, what do you think of modern and classical art? He goes on to say, I developed a theory that people who like abstract art are not capable of straight thinking. I believe they like chaos on their walls because they are full of chaos in their head and have no clear mission. Well, I would agree with you there, my friend. Regarding modern art, of course I don't like it because it's ugly. It's disgusting. It's not beautiful. Classical art was beautiful. Modern art is hideous. And I believe that modern art is hideous for a reason. If you look at modern art, you will be disgusted, and the only art that you will see today that is beautiful is advertising. So again, everything in this world comes down to getting you to buy something or taking something from you. Rather than looking at beautiful art, which is free, the only art that you can look at is hideous and ugly, and instead makes the art of advertising look very, very appealing and makes you want to purchase more. So modern art is more like agitation propaganda than it is art. It serves to agitate you and uh, drive you to buy, 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 buy. Money Study asks, can you talk about how welfare is another means of the elite to control people? Yes. Welfare is a tool of control because it takes away your power to provide for yourself. It enfeebles you and entitles you at the same time. It enfeebles you because you learn to not work for your money and it entitles you because you 
learn to beg with your hand out and take what you're given. Rather than going out and making your own fortune, making your own money, hunting your own food, building your own property, you sit there and do nothing and wait with your hand out to be given. And this gives them complete control over you because you'll take what they give you. And of course, friends, they only give you what they already take from you in the first place. Anything that's given to you is taken from people via taxes. And uh, this is why it is a tool of control. This is why when you go to the ghetto, you see people doing absolutely nothing to better themselves. They sit there enfeebled and entitled. So welfare is the worst thing you could ever do in your life. If you are struggling to make money, the worst thing you could do is take welfare because it virtually guarantees that the, the longer you take welfare, the less you're going to be able to provide for yourself, the less you are going to be independent, the more you're going to be reliant on the government, and that's the last thing you want to be. You do not want to be reliant on anybody else. A real man is self-reliant in all ways at all times. And the less self-reliant you are, the more enfeebled you become until eventually you can do absolutely nothing on your own and you are a docile farm animal in the control of people who have self-control and don't rely on entitlements and enfeeblement. Sebastian asks, why do you think yoga is bad? This might surprise some readers of B&D, but I have a two-fold opinion on yoga. It is good and it is bad. It is good in the sense that stretching is of vital importance for you. And I do a form of yoga every single day, multiple times a day, because stretching is so very, very important, especially to us people in the modern age who sit down in chairs on the computer most of the time. So, in fact, I try and get up every hour on the hour and do some form of stretching, uh, which you might call yoga, but I don't practice the spiritual side of yoga because yoga is really actually a religion posing as stretching. And this is why so many people who get involved in yoga become, they think they become enlightened or they think they become smarter than they really are. What happens when you think you are smarter than you are, you actually ironically become easier to become a target of manipulation. So if you look at all of these foolish women who go into yoga, these white women who go into yoga, you'll notice how they change and they, they think they're better than they are. They think they're smarter than they are. And what happens is that they're very easily taken advantage of by a lot of the new age spiritual guru stuff. So what happens when you don't understand what yoga actually is? It's a spiritual practice posing as stretching class for single moms. And uh, especially in the West, not so much in the East, but in the West, it, bec it makes these retarded, retarded Western women think they're so much smarter than they are. And again, when you think you're smarter than you are, you become a very easy target of manipulation. So this is why it leads these moron women to make very bad decisions in their life. So just uh, understand what yoga is. And uh, of course, you want to stretch every day. But don't think that yoga is going to give you enlightenment because it isn't. It's going to give you a physical release. It's going to make your body feel better. But the enlightenment uh, is not real. Curtis asks, Victor, if you were starting over, would you blog or podcast? If I were starting over today, I would blog 100%, no question, I would blog. Today, even more than when I started, there is a, a complete lack of great blogs. So it would be very easy today for someone to come in and take over the blog game. The only competition is bold and determined and uh, one or two others and that's it. So today the competition is, is dirt poor. It would be so easy for somebody who uh, understands how to put words together. It would be so easy to come in today and just clean up. So I would love to start a new blog today. It would be a lot of fun. There would be no competition. I would blog, absolutely. Dr. Don asks, I drink a lot of sparkling water, Perrier and LaCroix. Do you have an opinion on either of these in terms of health? Yeah, I do like to drink uh, sparkling water on occasion. It's actually my cheat meal at the moment is a, is a glass of sparkling water and some cheese. I like it, but I notice that it makes me burp and it makes my stomach not feel so great. So I have to think that there is some issue with the carbonation in the water that's probably not good for your stomach. So I, I tend to uh, try to limit my consumption of it, but it is fun as a cheat meal. He goes on to say, I get that corn and grain are not healthy, but with but with respect to the idea that it's only natural for man to eat meats and not vegetables, I'm having a hard time understanding this. Uh, according to my understanding, one cannot get all the vitamins and minerals needed to stay healthy from meat only. 
Well, your understanding is a little bit incorrect, my friend, because actually the only way that we can get the vitamins we need is from the meat. The human body has a very difficult time digesting the vitamins and the proteins from plants, and that is why when we eat them, we tend to shit them out looking nearly identical to the way we ate them. A cow, on the other hand, has a different stomach than us. A cow actually has four stomachs, and inside the stomach of the cow, the cow ferments the vegetables and actually throws up the vegetables and re-eats them again, and in this way is able to digest the, the, uh, the vegetation fully. As humans, we're not, it's not easy to digest these foods, and which is why if you eat nothing but vegetables, you will die. For example, vegan mothers who feed their children nothing but vegan food often go to jail for murder because the babies die. You cannot live on only vegetables because they're, you cannot get the vitamins that you need from the vegetables. On the other hand, you absolutely can live on only meat. The animals eat the vegetables that we cannot eat and they turn those vegetables into vitamins that we can then eat and digest. It would be very silly to say that we cannot get the vitamins from meat because the animals eat the vegetation that supposedly we get the vitamins from and they turn into vitamins by themselves. So that logic doesn't make sense. The animals eat the vegetation that we can't. They turn into vitamins. We eat the animals. That's how we get all of the vitamins that we need. And if you think it isn't true, try to live on only vegetables and see how long you can last. Orestes asks, Can you give us tips on how to deal with haters? All politically incorrect sites are attacked by feminists and other crazy people. How can B&D comments stay untouched by them? Have they stopped attacking or, or does censorship work so well? Well, the reality is I get hate mail every single day and I just don't publish it. I don't allow these people to negatively impact the experience of uh, the bold and determined blog. So I get hate mail nearly every single day by these crazy, the crazy left-wing people, the crazy feminists, the crazy vegans, the crazy marijuana addicts. They all leave me hate mail nearly constantly. And the way I deal with them is I simply ignore it. I don't give them a voice. I don't allow them to have their voice be heard because what they want to do is they want to disrupt the good time by bringing in negativity, and I simply don't allow it. And I would recommend that other blog artists do not allow negative comments on your blog because it messes up the experience for everybody else. The blogger should take it and accept it and not let anybody else have to deal with it. Uh, the nastiest people I run across are the vegans, the feminists, and the marijuana addicts. They all act nearly ex exactly the same. Very hate-filled people. And uh, good heavens no, I would never give them a voice on my blog. That's just silly. Humpty Dumpty asks, Do you have any opinions on fashion, i.e. what men ought to wear? I know you have endorsed the Iron and Tweed blog in the past, but do you subscribe to any particular fashion regimen for yourself? I like to stick with a classic fashion regimen. I like to wear, uh, I don't wear any branded t-shirts except for my own brand. I will not wear any branded t-shirts. I will never wear a shirt that says Nike or Gucci or anything like this. I will only wear a t-shirt that has my brand or nothing. Other than that, I will dress very classic, dark jeans, nice shoes, nice shirt. Depends on where I'm going to go if I want to dress up more than that. But I dress pretty business casual in the sense that I wear jeans and uh, a t-shirt when it's hot. And uh, that's pretty much it. Just look good, look classic. And uh, that's all you really need in this world. So I'll wear a nice black shirt, nice black watch, dark jeans, dark shoes. And uh, that's going to be it in the winter. You know, I'll wear a nice coat, perhaps a nice vest or whatever. I don't, uh, I don't have any particular brands. I don't care about brands whatsoever. I wear what looks good. And it's really as simple as that. I wear what looks good. And I recommend that you wear what looks good as well. Uh, if you are into fashion or want to get into fashion, I recommend you do read the Iron and Tweed blog, and I recommend you pick up his book, Casual Style 101. If you don't have an innate understanding of fashion and what looks good, it will help you to learn it. Gal Haddad asks, I'm a naturally curious person and have always been deeply studying things I find interesting. How can one continue intense researching with being a blogger? Okay, that's a great question. I've got a great answer for you. That's what you can do is simply put your findings in the blog and that's going to accomplish two things. You're going to be able to teach people what you have found, but also your passion and excitement is going to come through. If you research something intensely, 
you're going to be very, very excited about it. And you can transmute this excitement directly to your blog by writing about it and teaching other people who will share your same excitement for the certain topic. So that's a very great way to start a blog is to just find something you're interested in, research it, and then write about your findings. That would be a very, very interesting blog. In fact, that's what most bloggers actually do. They simply research what they're interested in and they share their findings on their blog. So that's how you can do that. Zacharias says, I have a suggestion for the guy struggling with poo-poo. Get a toilet stool online. It raises your feet so you're closer to a squat position. Okay, if you'll remember from the last episode, friends, we had a one of our listeners had a problem poo-pooing, could not poo-poo or pee-pee fully. And uh, somehow I completely forgot about my standard go-to poo-poo advice, which is this. And this advice is going to sound a little bit crazy, a little bit nuts, but hear me out. Okay, now in our modern world, we go poo-poo on toilets. The problem with this is that it's not the natural position to go poo-poo, and it can block your sphincter from evacuating fully. The natural way to go poo-poo is to squat. Now, if you Google Asian squat, you will find out what it looks like to actually squat. If you've seen Asian people squatting, this is how they rest. And actually, in most of Asia, they don't like to go poo-poo in our standard Western toilets where they sit down. They like to squat to go poo-poo. And uh, when you actually squat to go poo-poo, you, evacu you evacuate your bowels so much easier and so much better. It's really remarkable. I myself was disgusted by it at first. I thought it was beneath me. But I was forced into a position one day at the Beijing train station where I had to take a poo-poo, and it was either take a poo-poo at the train station, and the toilets in, in China are basically holes in the ground. So I was forced with the decision to poo-poo at the train station or poo-poo on the train. And the toilets on the train in China are holes in the ground, but you're moving at 200 miles an hour. So I bit the bullet. I went to the... Uh, go poo-poo in the train station in China, and uh, I really felt remarkable after. I had a burst of energy that I've not really felt from evacuating in a number of years. It's almost like when a dog goes out and goes to the toilet, and they get a burst of energy, and they, they run. They they go and run. They, they're happy again. It really feels like that when you actually evacuate fully. So there are a couple different suggestions to help you poo-poo better. You can go out to the forest uh, where nobody's looking, and you can squat. And if you're going to do that, I recommend you practice your squat first because most Westerners cannot do an Asian squat at all. They will fall over. So you'll need to practice your squat. But this is the number one way that you can evacuate your bowels fully. Another way is to get a toilet stool or a squatty potty, which you put into your bathroom and you simply, you simply elevate your feet so that you almost mimic the squat position. Now, it's not as good it's actually squatting. It's not going to open the muscles as well as squatting will, but it will help. So if you're scared to get out in the forest or you don't have anywhere you can squat to go poo-poo, I recommend you get yourself something like a squatty potty that will elevate your feet and help you go, help you uh, poo-poo a little bit better. So that's the number one suggestion I have. If you're having trouble evacuating your bowels fully, you must learn to squat, and if you cannot squat, if you don't have the ability to, to get out somewhere and squat, get yourself a squatty potty and uh, go from there. Clay asks, what is your thought about circumcision? Well, you know, it's not a very difficult subject. You should not cut off the penis of a little baby, a little eight-day-old, eight, eight nine-day-old baby. You should not cut its penis. This is a barbaric custom. This is... Uh, this is one of the worst customs that we in the West practice, and it should be abolished. You should not cut the penis of a baby. If you are a father or a mother listening, you should not circumcise your child because it can scar the child for life. You can do lots of other damage that they can't recover from. You can do psychological damage that they won't remember but will be imprinted in their mind. You should not cut the penis of a little baby. It is barbaric. So don't do it. Dan asks... Victor, I've been enjoying the podcast a lot. Thanks for making it. Here's my question. I read somewhere that all powerful men must have three women in their lives, their wife, their lover, and their girlfriend. What do you think? Do all or most powerful men have these relationships? Should a powerful man be 100% faithful? Or you think it is simply a matter of preference? 
All right. First off, I'm going to say it is a matter of preference, but for powerful men, they prefer to not stick with one lady. And it's really as simple as that. For you, for a regular person who is not uh, on the quest for power, stick with what you prefer. But for powerful men, there's no way that they stick with one lady. That's absurd. They don't do it. Uh, sex builds energy. And there's no way you're going to continue to build energy by pounding the same lady over and over again for years and years and years. All powerful people know this, that sex builds energy. And uh, what would be the reason for all powerful men have a a wife who is more like a partner rather than a sex object. And when you're married or when you have a long-term girlfriend, you'll start to understand this, that you stop, you stop viewing your missus as a sexual object and she becomes more of a partner in your life. She's more of a a plotter with you rather than a sex object and then you you want to go ahead and uh, put your peepee into other objects and that's what happens she becomes more like the queen to your king but you still need to play around with your your play toys and that's why all powerful men are not faithful and uh, that's that speaking of powerful men all powerful men are selfish and for very good reason it works Beyond that, if you want to be faithful to modern women, I don't really see a point because modern women are basically good for two things, pumping and dumping. Modern wives unironically demand that their husband be faithful and then they refuse to have sex with them. So again, as a matter of choice in your particular perspective, in your particular misses, but if you're talking about power, of course it is true that they are not faithful. Nick Hagut asks, what is the most unique creature or feature you've seen while traveling deep into nature? My favorite thing about traveling deep into nature is simply looking up at the stars and seeing how incredible they look when you get outside of the light pollution of the city. In the city, we have all these lights and this light pollution. And it makes it very difficult to really see the stars and the cosmos the way they are meant to be seen. When you get out into the mountains where there are no lights around for miles and you you look up at the stars about three o'clock in the morning. They are gigantic. And it's like you're watching, it's like you're watching a video of eternity. And I can understand how all of the rig all of the religions actually developed by looking at the stars and then creating stories of the stars. This is how we get things like worshiping the sun and then the sun becoming the son of God, Christ. This is how thing this is how all of our religions developed is by looking at the stars. And when you get on into nature and you look at the stars without light pollution, you see just how incredible they are. When I was camping out in the mountains of New Mexico, I got out at uh, about three o'clock in the morning to go pee pee. And as soon as I opened my tent, I was almost blinded by the the just vast array of stars in the sky. And immediately I saw a shooting star, which I hadn't seen in a number of years, and then probably two seconds later, I saw another shooting star. So it was really incredible for me to get back to the state, go to the mountains, see these beautiful stars and to see two shooting stars back to back, which is something I've never experienced before. And uh, I recommend that if you have the means, get out to nature and look at the stars because they are incredible. And that is where the basis of all of our religions come from is the stars. Blue Chris asks, how can I worry less about what people think of me? This is a great question, but it's not something that I've ever personally struggled with. The answer is that you have to be sure of what you're doing. You have to be positive that what you're doing is correct. And I've always felt that what I was doing was correct. I've never been uncertain about myself. And this is why I've never been concerned about what people think of me. If you are concerned about what people think of you, congratulations, you are what we call a regular person. 85, perhaps 95% of the people in the world fall into this category. And uh, what you can do to break free of this is to start actually believing in yourself. Most people in the world don't believe in themselves because there's nothing to believe in. Most people in the world don't do the work necessary to become expert at something. And because they don't do the work necessary, they don't develop the confidence necessary to not worry about what people think of you. If you spent 10 years studying a subject or creating something then what some idiot who has never studied it or created it thinks about you would not matter you only listen to what other people think because you yourself are not an expert at whatever it is that you 
wish to be an expert at. When you become an expert, the opinions about other people become meaningless because you know, and that's what you want to do. You want to know, not think or believe. You want to know. And when you know, it doesn't matter what people who don't know think. Kyle asks, how to stop hating the sound of your own voice? Very easy. Listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And then after you've listened to it, listen to it again over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You will start to like what you continually hear. You will start to like the sound of your own voice if you listen to it continuously. It's really as simple as that. It will take time and it will take patience. Do it and you will come to like the sound of your own voice rather than hate it. Everybody hates the sound of their own voice the first time they hear it. They think, is that me? Do I really sound like that? What is that? And then eventually you just get used to it and stop caring and even start to like it. Wolf asks, hey Vic, what are your thoughts on global warming? Global warming is another fraud perpetrated by the quote unquote shadow people who want to take all control away from you, who want to take everything from you and keep everything for themselves. Global warming is what we call a problem reaction solution. They give you a problem that causes you to be afraid and then they give you a solution. If you never heard the words global warming and you simply lived in the world, you would never in a million years think that global warming exists because it's not getting hotter in the world. It's exactly the same as it was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. You would never notice this. It takes them creating a fear in you to start believing this. This is what we call the Hegelian dialectic. They create a problem that creates fear in you. And the only way to ease this fear is to give them more control. The Hegelian dialectic, problem, reaction, solution. Create the problem, then create the solution. Of course, it's not real. The seasons change. They always have. The weather has always gone in cycles. And in fact, there is no global warming. They even under the radar admitted this because they changed the words global warming to climate change. Climate change, which could mean absolutely anything. And in fact, the science says we're going to be entering into a new ice age rather than a warm age because the, the oceans are, they are not melting. They are not receding. They're exactly the same as they always were. It is a lie to get you to be afraid and to give up control. Michael asks, I've been living in China for four years and I'm looking to leave. You've traveled and lived in several Asian countries. Which one would you say is the best to live and work in? Okay, there is no best one to work in. I recommend you work online so you don't actually have to work. The best Asian country to live in by far, without question, is Thailand, which is why I've lived in Thailand for most of the time I've done Bold and Determined. Thailand is a wonderful beautiful, incredible country, though it does, of course, have problems. But in regards to Asia, Thailand is the best that I've ever been to by far. And uh, that's that. Of course, it has problems. It's way too hot. It's way too polluted. Uh, it's a little bit dirty. It's kind of stinky. But it's got a lot of charm. There's a lot of great things that come out of Thailand. It's much cheaper than, say, Japan or Korea. So Thailand is the best. And if you go there, you're going to notice. And if you go there, you're going to notice about 10 million other foreigners who know the same thing, that Thailand is the best. And that's why it is so, at the moment, is, Thailand is so completely overrun by foreigners. It's not even good to go to anymore unless you go to one of the provinces that are nearly untouched or undiscovered by foreigners. But in Bangkok, Phuket, Pattaya, Chiang Mai, it's completely overrun by foreigners because they know Thailand is awesome. Levi asks, hey, Vic, what do you think about living or working in Japan? I'm not a fan of Southeast Asia, and as of currently, I'm dependent on the IT industry. Options would be Shanghai, Singapore, or Tokyo. Okay, I think uh, Japan would be my number two for living in Asia. Absolutely, I think would be my number two, because Japan has terrific food. They are clean and orderly people, and it's a nice, safe place. It's not dirty and chaotic like the rest of Asia. Uh, regarding Shanghai, I, do, I wouldn't want to live in China for... It's fine for a little while, but not as a, a long-term place. And Singapore is probably the most boring city in the world. Yeah. And the problem with Singapore is that it's just a city. It's not a state. It's not a country. It's just a city. And if you want to go somewhere else, you have to go through customs at Singapore and wherever else you're going. So anytime you want to leave this one single city, it's an ordeal where you've got to go through customs. So 
Tokyo or Osaka would be my number two pick about li living in Asia. It sounds like uh, an incredible thing to do, and uh, we'll see. I might even do it myself one of these days. Chris asks, what does a person do about drug withdrawal? I understand your explanation on a logical level, but when I try to give up the drugs, the withdrawals are too damn bad. Okay, the reality is this. You're getting withdrawals because you're not ready to give up the drugs. If you were mentally ready to give up the drugs, you would not experience withdrawal. If you were actually seriously done with drugs and you meant it mentally, you would not experience this. You are experiencing this because you are on the fence about actually giving them up because the addiction has taken a hold of you and you are not actually sure you are done with it. This is why people go to rehab 9, 10, 11 times and they never quit because they never fully commit. You have to understand that the reason you want these drugs is because they give you the problems that they then solve. Like we talked about with global warming, it's a, it's a reason of problem, reaction, solution. You do the drugs once just to have a, a nice time or whatever. Eventually, those drugs start to give you problems that you then need the drugs to solve. So you would not have withdrawal symptoms from never doing drugs. You would not have the need to do these drugs without ever doing them in the first place. So the act of doing them gives you the problems that they then fix. People say that cigarettes calm their anxiety, but that's not true. Cigarettes give them the anxiety that a new cigarette then calms, but it only lasts for so long and you get anxious again, then you need another cigarette. On and on and on and on until you're smoking two packs a day. When you understand this mentally and you turn off this desire, you turn off this need, you can quit in an instant. You, you will experience nothing. It is your mind's way of telling you, withdrawal is your mind's way of telling you that you are not actually serious about quitting. When you are serious about quitting and you know, not think, but know you don't need these drugs anymore, you will not experience withdrawal. You would simply quit and you will not need them ever again. Freddie asks, Victor, there is a relatively new trend on YouTube. Some channels upload a content they call subliminals. They play binaural sounds and at the same time they add some affirmations that can only be heard and or understood by your subconscious. The creators of these subliminals claim that they can help you change your personality, your body, and even the color of your eyes. What are your thoughts in regards to this subject? Okay, this is absolutely true. You can be hypnotized by videos that play binaural beats in the background and have uh, subliminal subliminal messages in them. This is absolutely true. The advertising industry has known this for a number of years. And what's even worse than what's going on on YouTube is going on in the porn in the porn world, in the internet porn world. They are hypnotizing people using this binaural beats music and using these flashing images. And that's why you see so many. That's one reason why you see so many of these trannies today saying that they're trannies they're not they were never men they always felt like a tranny these people are being hypnotized by these subliminal subliminal and not so subliminal messages and this the binaural beats when you listen to binaural beats it opens your mind to suggestions that you would not otherwise be open to so binaural beats are very powerful so i i recommend you be very careful about what you do what you read what you watch or listen to if you listen to binaural beats because it can and does put you in a state of uh, hypnotic induction. It can hypnotize you, in other words. So these things are true. Uh, unscrupulous people will use them to sell you stuff or create havoc in your life. So you have to be very careful about the media that you consume. Of course, you should never watch pornography. That should be the last thing you ever watch. Uh, and in regards to YouTube, you should be very careful about what you listen to and why you listen to it and what you're doing when you listen to it. So some of this stuff can be great. Some of the binaural beats can be great to listen to while you're studying or reading a book or writing. They can block out other distractions. But you have to know that the, the creator of this stuff is not putting subliminal, I can't even say the damn word, subliminal messages in the content because that can and will hypnotize you. As you'll learn from the book Shadow Men, which I recommended at the beginning of this podcast, you're very easy to be, you're, you're very suggestible. As a human, you are very suggestible, and it's very easy to control your mind with things you don't know or don't understand. 
And if even if they were pointed out to you, you'd say, no, that's not true. That's not real. The fact is, mind control is very real, and it's quite easy when you understand how these things are done. Chez asks, hey, Vic, what are your thoughts on building a blog based on poetry? Well, actually, I think it's a great idea because it seems as though there are no great poets today. I couldn't name a single living poet, for example. Obviously, we have a lot of great poets from the past who have given us a lot of great work, a lot of great fairy tales, a lot of fables, a lot of things that we, we can learn a lot from a poem that we that we can't learn from a how-to guide or from a technical manual. Poetry can teach us in an allegorical or metaphorical way, which helps our brains to learn things in a different way than straight up instructions would. So poetry is fantastic, assuming, of course, that you are a good poet or not a bad poet. The world is starved for beauty. So I recommend that you give the world some beauty. Haria asks, what are your thoughts on Charles Bukowski, the writer? Okay, I'm, I've always been a fan of Bukowski. And in fact, I've always considered myself a form of Bukowski, who was the exact opposite of Bukowski. So Bukowski was a writer who was an alcoholic, a, a sex fiend. Uh, he was an ugly kid. He had bad acne and had terrible scars on his face. And he was interested in the, the, the lower side of life. I myself am interested in success and cleanliness and the, the high side. But uh, he was a vulgar man, and I'm a bit of a vulgar man as well, if you read B&D. So I've always considered myself the opposite of a Bukowski. I'm a, a go-getter, whereas he's a bit of a no-getter. But I do enjoy a lot of his poems. And in fact, I want to read one of his poems to you that I think will be uh, a little bit funny. This poem by Bukowski is called Friendly Advice to a Lot of Young Men. Go to Tibet. Ride a camel. Read the Bible. Dye your shoes blue. Grow a beard. Circle the world in a paper canoe. Subscribe to the Saturday Evening Post. Chew on the left side of your mouth only. Marry a woman with one leg and shave with a straight razor. And carve your name in her arm. Brush your teeth with gasoline. Sleep all day and climb trees at night. Be a monk and drink buckshot and beer. Hold your head underwater and play the violin. Do a belly dance before pink candles. Kill your dog. Run for mayor. Live in a barrel. Break your head with a hatchet. Plant tulips in the rain, but don't write poetry. It's a poem by Bukowski that I thought was a little bit funny given our topic of discussion. He was a poet of his day and had a very hard time making money. In fact, he worked at the post office for 20 years because he was not able to make a living as a writer. One day, after 20 years of working at the post office, he decided to give it up and go into writing full-time. Of course, he lived very, very poor because of this, but because he decided to leave his job and focus on his art, we have a lot of great poetry from Bukowski. Benjamin asks, I come from the upper middle class, and as such, I've been raised to be civil and polite. The older I get, the more I find being less polite earns more respect. What is your perspective on when to be polite and when not to be? When you want to be polite is when you don't want something from somebody. If you don't want somebody to respect you, if you're not looking to get anything from somebody, then it's perfectly fine to be polite. On the other hand, if you are actually trying to get somebody to do something for you, if you are trying to get something your way, if you're trying to get somebody to respect you, it is better to not be polite. The more polite you are, the more invisible you are in this world. The more impolite you are, the more people are going to listen to you. The loudest mouth gets fed. The quietest mouth does not. So even though it's nice to be polite to friends and family and people at Starbucks, in the world of business or in the world of getting stuff done or in the multicultural world, it does not pay to be polite. It pays to be a jerk. And that's really just the way it is. So when I want things done my way, I'm impolite. I'm never polite. If I don't care, if I, and in fact, if I want, say, if I want a girl to not like me, I will be polite to her, and that way I can assure that she will not remember me. Jack Freeman asks, question for you, Vic. Curious if you ever used contemplating your own death for motivation. I have discovered this a little while back and just posted a blog post about it. By far the most powerful motivation exercise in existence. It's crazy. It's not talked more widespread and is still mostly unknown. 
No, I've never contemplated my own death for motivation. I assume that you mean when you die, what will people remember you by? Um, no, it's not something that I ever thought about. I know that if I just do good work, people in the future will always remember great work, especially if it's a written great work. So I've always understood that if you write great work, it will stand the test of time and it will live on even long after you die. I never had to contemplate my own death to understand this. I just know that we still read Nietzsche and Socrates and so on. So I've always had this in the back of my mind that my writing is not just for today. I've never written for today and I never will. I've written all my great articles with the thought that they are going to live on even 100, 200, perhaps 500 years in the future. So I never write for today. I never, you never hear me talk about current events on the blog. I don't give a good goddamn about what's going on in the world today. I write for people of the future. So I guess you could say that uh, in a way, I have contemplated my own death for motivation. Will asks, I find that when I'm using the computer or smartphone for a while, my eyes get dry and feel as if they are burning. I also find that my head stiffens up and my brain becomes foggy. Any insight? Yeah. Put the phone down, close the computer, go outside and go for a walk. A big cause of brain fog in this world that we did not discuss in the last episode is the constant use of computers and phones. Imagine just sitting down in the same spot for hours on end and looking at a rock. Do you think you would have an incredibly clear mind or would you, get, would you get so bored that your mind becomes dull and blurry if you just sat down in the same spot, didn't move, and stared at a rock? Of course you would get brain fog. Now, we think that we can stare at these gadgets all day and not get brain fog and not get all these different problems with the eyes. Of course we're going to have problems if we're just sitting down and staring at these inanimate objects, this virtual reality, and uh, thinking that it's real reality when it's not. These things are virtual reality. Turn off your phone and stare at it for an hour and see how far that gets you. You're going to be bored out of your mind within 15 or 20 seconds. So if you want to cure the brain fog and the eye burning that you get from staring at your smartphone or your computer, put them away. Go for a walk, go to the gym, go for a drive, put them away and let your eyes heal and your brain fog will vanish. Florio asks, what's the key to happiness? Ooh, friend, this is a very, very big topic. What do you say we go into this topic at the beginning of the next episode of the Bold and Determined Podcast? I will give you a nice soliloquy on what is the key to happiness. In the meantime, my friendly friends, I want you to do me a big, solid favor. I want you to... I want you to go to iTunes and leave the Bold and Determined Podcast a five-star review. Do this so that other people can find this podcast and perhaps get some of their questions answered and become enlightened in ways that uh, would not be possible if they never found the B&D Podcast. Thank you for listening, my friendly friends. Have yourself a great day.